Hello, everyone who's joining us from London and Silicon Valley and Hong Kong and New York and elsewhere, all the other hot spots of the world. Uh, thank you for joining us today for our Ask a VC Anything show. And many of you have been with us before and you know our series of shows. And uh, we started them during COVID, of course. And, and now uh, we've done 40 shows already. Uh, and uh, are still adding them up. And we're the only platform, I think, that's actually showcasing global VCs. We've been all over the world with this, uh, with this uh, program. And you know, I appreciate everyone who has signed on and joined us today. You can see what else we do here. Uh, we have our newsletter and we have our YouTube videos. Uh, many of our videos are on there from this show. You can check it out. We've had everyone from John Chambers uh, to Gary Rochelle, uh, to China VCs, to Singapore VCs, to India VCs, and uh, now London. Uh, so many of you, I think, also know a little bit about my books. Uh, there they are. A new one is coming up soon. So um, more on that later. Uh, today, I'm going to be welcoming Hussein Kanji. Hello, Hussein. How are you? I see you there in the screen. And uh, you're coming in from London. How are you? I'm good. Doing well. Good, good. Well, we're going to hear all about your story today. I met Hussein oh, a, a while ago in London. And you participated in one of our Silicon Dragon shows there. And we've been in touch ever since then. Um, the interesting, really interesting thing about Hussein is that, you know, he's one of the few uh, European-based uh, VCs who really get Silicon Valley. And I think what he's done is amazing is that bringing some of the, his career experience and expertise from Silicon Valley over to London. Uh, so we'll get to hear a little bit more about that. I learned a little bit more about uh, Hussein and just doing preparation for this program today. I learned that he grew up in New York City. Uh, I learned that he went to Stuyvesant High School which is for brilliant people. Uh, so, uh, and then uh, he went to Stanford. Uh, he got his MBA from London Business School. He worked at Microsoft in a bunch of different roles, strategic planning, analysis, tech. So I learned that he's kind of a techie, but he's also very strategic and he's a good investor. He's got an eye for new technologies. He, that's why uh, probably that Excel partners hired him and Excel was sent you to London, right, Hussein? Yeah, I joined the, the London team uh, kind of a few years after they started it. Okay. He's on the board of more than a dozen startups. I think I lost count. I just said more than a dozen startups, and he's a board advisor on others. So Hussein is a very busy person. We really appreciate that he's joined us today. What a little bit about Hoxton Ventures. Well, Hoxton is known of uh, his name after this area in London, like Silicon Roundabout, right, you're saying? It's, it's a little part of East London that's kind of become a techie enclave, or, or we thought it was a neat name for a fund. Oh, no, I agree, I, I really like it. I once stayed in the Hoxton Hotel in that area of London. It's very trendy. <laughs> it's very Silicon Valley-like. So I like yeah, it. that was actually started by a classmate of mine in business school, and we were debating whether we should split the name between ourselves. Uh, because he had the hotel and I had the fund. Oh, I see. Okay, well, um, it sounds like it all worked out. So, yep. Hoxton, uh, you founded this uh, with a couple of partners back in 2013, so it's almost 10 years old, which is hard to believe. And yeah, time flies. What's that? I said time, time flies. Oh, yeah. Three funds, three partners, four unicorns sectors, leading edge tech, consumer. Uh, you know, uh, it, one other interesting tidbit is that I, you know, I kind of grasped the idea that uh, Hussein likes kind of these oddball deals, like nobody else would really think about them. So he's on these deals before other people get to them. And before they become, you know, wide known or before the Silicon Valley types want to invest in them. So I think that this is part of the success story of Hawks and Ventures and his own career. And as I said before, I think they brought Sil Silicon Valley to Europe. A uh, couple IPOs as well, Dark Trace, Deliveroo, which uh, I'm sure 
the same will be telling us about these two. Um, the dark trace is what in cybersecurity. That's right. Yeah, it's a it's a threat intelligence uh, platform or threat detection platform. Okay, and Deliveroo is kind of like for for people in the Bay Area, kind of like the DoorDash of Europe or the DoorDash of, of Europe and, and a lot of places in Asia as well outside of China, so Singapore and Hong Kong. Okay, very good. So for those who are first timers to our program, you know that you can put your question or your comment into the chat box. I see one person already has done that. So I appreciate that. I'll be monitoring that. And then you can ask questions there too. So you can ask questions directly to Hussein and we'll get it answered for you. This is the only show that you can do this on and the only global one too. So anyhow, um, let's get started. I'm gonna stop the share now and uh, we're gonna go for a, a little while and please warm up your questions in the meantime because I really wanna get to those and make this a very interactive kind of session. We're also gonna have a poll where you get to interact as well and sound off with your own opinions. So that's kind of fun. All right. Um, so um, now, um, so what do you, I mean, what do you think about my introduction? Did I, did I nail it or not? What did I get wrong, yeah, what did I get right? No, I think you, ca you captured most of it. I, I am an American who ended up kind of running away from New York because my high school was too competitive and went to a reasonably competitive university, but a, com a competitive university is in, in the sunshine. Ended up getting sucked into the tech industry, moved up north uh, from there to Seattle to, to join Microsoft and then relocated to London because I missed living in a, in a big global city. And Seattle is a great place, but, but it's not a big global city. And then joined Excel a few years there, uh, kind of pretty grateful that they taught me the ropes on how to invest, and then had this idea that there were not enough seed investors and early stage investors in Europe. There are a lot of later stage investors, but not many early stage investors, mm -hmm. and set up Oxton uh, with one other with one other colleague who I convinced uh, to join. We both knew each other from the, our Stanford days, and we set up our firm uh, of, of two. We're now a firm of four, so we're not we're not particularly big in terms of people, but we've done a pretty good job, I think, with on the investment sides and and picking companies that kind of grow up to become really interesting size uh, companies in new markets. So, what? How do you gauge the European tech scene? I, I remember when I was back at Red Herring Magazine, we were always writing about, oh, well, Europe will get the, you know, well, they'll have a gigantic tech company one of these days, and it's just not as entrepreneurial as the Silicon Valley or even China. Uh, so has that changed at all? Has this image of London, uh, European tech and venture, is it changing? Uh, it, it's changed dramatically, but I don't think you would recognize it unless unless you were out here on, on the ground. And I think the the reason for the change happened for a couple of different different reasons. So historically, and people have been thinking about Europe, Europe always produces R&D, it has really good universities, you know, has really great science programs, the EU is a good funder of grants, et cetera. But I think the challenge is it's hard to commercialize these things and turn them into big companies. And people have been believing in Europe since the 70s, 80s, and 90s, the 2000s, a lot of money in the dot-com bubble. That's actually what drew Axel and Benchmark uh, to Europe to set up the firms. And, and Benchmark actually then cut ties with its European colleagues and kind of retrenched back to, to Silicon Valley. And they didn't really retrench. They were always in Silicon Valley. They just cut ties with the London shop, which had to rename uh, it, itself. And you know it was tough. I, I think to build really high, like really valuable companies out of Europe. But a few things changed, and they all roughly changed around the same time. So around the financial crisis in 2008, you know, if you were a great graduate from Oxford or Cambridge, your your destiny was to go work in the city of London, you know, kind of our our Wall Street, or it was to go be a consultant to the McKinsey or Bain. You know, if you told your family you were going to go join some fledgling little company. You know, that was that was not seen as something very credible. And, you know, probably the same thing is true in most places outside of Silicon Valley around the same time time frame. But the financial crisis meant that there were no jobs for these folks. So if you're a young graduate, you couldn't go work for Wall Street or the city of London. You kind of had to go figure out something else to do. And that, that caused a bunch of younger people to come into the tech industry. And some of these younger people ended up going to YC and kind of joining these programs that are very global uh, in, inherently. And, you know, that started bringing some of that Silicon Valley DNA in, into Europe in, in, in a good way. And then around the same time, you know, people forget, but, you know, Apple released its iPhone in 2007, and then the App Store came out in 2008. So all of a sudden, if you're a European company and you're building an app, like a mobile app, 
you could get to a global audience from day one. And the challenge with Europe, and it's always been the challenge with Europe, even when you read the history books, it's very fragmented. And every little place in Europe is very different from each other, which means if you're going to try and scale up in Europe in a non-digital way, you have to go build a sales force, et cetera. You know, you've got to cover every single one of those little regions. And it's hard, right? You're much better off being in China, which is much more homogenous, or being in the U.S., which is much more homogenous. You get to scale much faster. Uh, and it doesn't help that Europeans historically are kind of late adopters versus early adopters as well. But when the App Store came out, you know, you build your little app. Let's assume it's a game. Angry Birds is a good example. You know, you put it on the App Store, and all of a sudden, you know, you have a billion people around the planet playing your game. And that 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 kind of dynamic really changes the calculus for for a European company. And that that those these all happened roughly around the same time, 2008. And then Facebook released an API, same exact thing, distribution all over the world, building on top of Facebook as a platform. And it gave Europeans a chance to be able to build these kinds of companies. Still early days, you didn't see very much output on this stuff. But if you understood that these were big seismic changes, uh, cultural change and these platforms, you could believe that eventually Europe would catch up. So that's what formed Toxton back in back in 2013. And in that year, there was about six billion of invested capital in all of Europe. And by comparison, by the way, China was about 60, and America is probably about 80 or 90. So you could see the big delta, and it's like a 10x difference. You know, today or this past year in 2021, Europe had 116 billion invested into it, and this 116 billion didn't get invested because you know people just want to believe in Europe. It's because there are a bunch of companies coming out of Europe, and we when we think about some of these household name companies in tech, you know, if you're if you're a podcast listener or a music listener, you know, you think of Spotify. Spotify came out of Sweden. If, if you ever bought, you know, buy one of these products online and you do a buy now, pay it later, you know, there's a, there's a great company in the U.S. A firm. It went public. It's Max Levchin's company from PayPal. But by far and away, the clear market leader in that space is Klarna. And it's a Swedish company. It came to the U.S. reasonably late in its history. But even even after coming late into the U.S., it's kind of it's kind of doing a really great job against the firm and all the other competitors and European company. And then, you know, Stripe, which is probably the most valuable fintech company, isn't really a European company because it's unfair to call it a European company because it started in Ireland, got seated in Ireland, then went to YC and became an American company and is a very U.S.-centric company, but it's run by two Irish brothers who did start in Dublin. And so, you know, you now have a bunch of case studies in Europe for some of these companies kind of really turning big. And some of the big U.S. funds are starting to pay attention to this. So probably the best fund, the fund that I kind of admire most alongside a benchmark is Sequoia, and Sequoia has now opened up a European office. So there's a U.S. office and a European office. It's one global partnership. If you if you Google Sequoia uh, and you look at the the, he, the homepage like title, which you can't really pull up in a browser very easily these days, you used to be able to. You know, it will say Sequoia. You you know, your U.S. slash Europe or U.S. plus Europe. In other words, they really think about this market as one one market. And they think about Sequoia China being a little bit different. They think about Sequoia India being a little bit different, but they think of Europe. That they think of both these companies on both sides of the ponds are going after the same market, and they're they're trying to become global companies on the basis of the U.S. and Europe. And every once in a while, in these categories, you know, it's the European company that ends up winning the category. So, like, if you go to like gaming and and, and 3D models, it, it's Unity 3D that everyone uses. It's a Danish company. Regrettably, it was a company that I passed on when when I was at Axel, and I've stayed in touch with the founder and the founders and LP and the fund, which is good because I did something right. But you know. We, we we turned that down because I didn't think it could be I didn't think it could become big enough and today it's like a forty forty fifty billion dollar company so shows you what I kind of knew I thought it the max size that, that could be was like a two hundred fifty million dollar acquisition and I'm sometimes even guilty of this like small mindset that 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 European investors have right because you have to see the potential and what these companies could be if things really go well and that's one thing that Silicon Valley does really well it's one thing China's built really well is if you're going to be a successful VC you really have to think about what what can be, not what won't be, because you can always just talk yourself out of these deals. You can always find the, the the flaws, and you know you have to relax these assumptions sometimes and say, you know, if all these stars kind of lined up the right way, you know, could this company really, really be great, and could it really kind of grow into something really, really substantial? And and other people around the table, you know, in front of you, capable of doing that. And I think, you know. There's much more of that today in, in Europe. There's much more of that thinking, and there's much more of those kinds of companies that you can actually really believe in. So we're, we're pretty excited about the future future of European tech. So you're, you're going to stay focused on European tech and not uh, think about Silicon Valley then, for instance? 
So our, our view is these are these are global markets, and if you're a European company, you probably and this is going to sound counterintuitive. You probably shouldn't care so much about the European market. So we're really bullish about European tech. We're not so we're not so convinced about the European market per se, because if you're starting off in a small country, um, Latvia it's really easy to understand why you shouldn't care so much about the Latvian market, because even if you won the Latvian market, you're probably not even going to become a $100 million company. It's just too small. It's a small Baltic state next to Estonia. People don't even, probably most Americans probably couldn't even identify it on the map. I don't think I could identify it on the map because I'm like, a, like most Americans pretty bad with geography. So, so countries like that or founders like that coming out of countries like that have to think about big global markets because that's the only way they're going to scale. And this is the Israeli model. Like Israel itself is a small country, but most Israeli entrepreneurs think about the U.S. market pretty early on. And these days they think about the China market as, as well. And so the small countries do that. The big countries in Europe are deceptive because Germany is a big country. France is a big country. You know, the U.K. is a big country. But these countries are still much smaller on their own compared to the U.S. and China. And so you can win that home market, but if you if you focus on the home market in those countries, and you then scale to your neighboring country, you know you've got to start almost almost from scratch all over again. So that that makes it hard. And by then that by that time, there's usually an American company who has the same idea. And if they win the American market, they're so much bigger than you are, which means by the time they're ready for expansion, you're ready for expansion. And then guess what? The next, the third country, the second country you're going into, they're probably also going in there as well. And those things usually lead to a bad outcome for the for the company in Europe. You end up becoming the acquisition company for the American company. And so our view is you should start in Europe and you should get as, as, as aggressive as possible about U.S. expansion. Because if you're going to, if you think you have the ingredients to be able to win, if you have the best product, the best team, et cetera, you should try and win the American market. The same way the American companies are thinking about winning the American market. Yeah, it's going to be more competitive. Yeah, it's going to be more expensive. But if you win the American market from Europe, you can always come back and win Europe the same way the Americans do, and you'll be so much bigger. And, you know, one of our companies, which went public last year, which is Deliveroo, was neck and neck with DoorDash in its history. You know, DoorDash is a couple of months earlier, maybe three months earlier than, Door and, than Deliveroo. And you know, if you look at its revenue, they were basically tracking each other. Both companies had really good outcomes. They're both publicly traded companies. Like as a seed investor, we're delighted with what happened with Deliveroo. But if you look at DoorDash's market cap and you look at Deliveroo's market cap, there's like a 10x difference. And so one has won Europe and one has won America. And one, arguably won Europe and it won Singapore and Hong Kong and Dubai and a bunch of other cities. But the American one is that much bigger. I mean, I think the prize is that much bigger. And, you know, I'm a big believer in China, but I think the challenge with China is it's it's not really a fair place in terms of if you're a European company, even if you're an American company, it doesn't mean you're going to have a fair shot in, in China about winning that market. I think the Chinese companies, are, you know, who, who the companies that win in China are largely domestic companies. Um, so I don't think you can easily go into China, but I think as a, as a European company, you can easily go into the U.S. So a lot of our Silicon Valley heritage a lot of our contacts, our networks, you know, are used to help our companies kind of scale up. And one of the best things about the fund is we do very little outbound. For the longest time, we used to have not much of a website. So people find us. It's not us finding people. And they want us on their boards or on their cap tables because they're looking towards the U.S. And when you look around the European market, you have the very large established funds. Axel would be a great example of this. But the challenge with Axel is it's not a seed investor. You know, it would much rather be a Series A, Series B type investor. And so if you can get the check from Axel, you probably will. You probably won't prioritize Hoxton, but you probably will end up talking to Index and Axel and Sequoia and Hoxton at the same time if you're doing a seed round. And chances are, you know, out of all of those four firms, the pure firm that's focused on seed is probably going to make you an offer. And, and, you know, we win more than our fair share of deals against those guys for, for those reasons. And that's how we kind of get our deal flow. Okay. By really focusing on the early stage and that's your value add and also your Silicon Valley uh, heritage. Being a bridge. Yeah. Being a bridge back to California. Right. Okay. That's good. Um, so let's, let's see. We've got a couple of questions in here. Um, all right. Um, there's a question about, okay, someone just asked about your view of China, which you kind of just uh, went into, um, and its relationship to the rest of the world, considering China is separating from the Western world. Any, any comment on that? I, mean, I think China, unfortunately, there's a, there's, 
there's a bunch of trade stuff happening, and you know, there's a there's just a bunch of resistance to to, to, ch to Chinese companies kind of scaling internationally. You know, I'm hoping that all of this stuff, you know, generally speaking, like good trade is good for everybody, right? You build relationships with the other side, you know, it leads to kind of more peace than it than it, and, and prosperity for both sides. So I'm a I'm a big believer in this thing. I wish the Chinese market was more open and more fair for for foreign companies because one of the challenges with China is, you know, it's it's it, it's not always the easiest. For, for an American company or any kind of foreign company to be able to really crack, but but I'm hoping these are these are temporary things. It's trying to kind of build its domestic economy and gets good and you know hopefully opens up over time. But there is this decoupling and and as a result, you know I think there's a bunch that's part of what's been driving so much money I think into Europe, uh, especially mm -hmm. the last few years, because if you're an investor in the West and you, you know or or in the Middle East and you're thinking about you know putting capital to work in China and China is kind of getting a little bit more closed off. You've got to find a home for that capital, and around the same time, this European batch of companies is actually starting to look a lot better than the last batch of companies, which looks a lot better than the previous batch of companies. Mm -hmm. So we know that a bunch of money is actually flowing to to, the, to Europe as a result of what's kind of directly been happening with China. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what about in the semiconductor market? Uh, there's a question about uh, UK, EU, VC investor investments in the semiconductor industry. Will there be a revival? So I think I think if you use if you use Apple products or you know and, and you take you just look at you know look at their latest generation laptops you can see what the importance of silicon actually looks like and the fact that you know silicon makes a big difference Facebook now has an engineering team that builds its own silicon Google has its own silicon team Apple has its own silicon team you know I I think people have realized that semiconductors actually really do matter but the challenge with semiconductors it's a bit of a big boys game. You know, building a fab, taping out a chip. I mean, these are these are expensive capital expenditure projects, and you know, on on the fab side, and even building a chip from scratch takes, you know, it used to take tens of millions, and it went to kind of a hundred million. It's like hundreds of millions at this point. You know, I don't think it's a startup type market, and I do think you need to you you do need to be a big company to do this. There's a big strategic question. You know, if you're in the U.S., like, do you want to build this kind of capacity in the country just for national security reasons? Because so much of that that industry sits inside of China. You know, just just a couple of months ago, you know, Intel itself, which historically has always made all of its stuff, decided it's going to send some of its business to TSMC. Um, you know, so so there's some changes here, and there's some strategic things that are way above my pay grade. One thing about Europe is Europe has almost none of that capacity. So historically, mm -hmm. Europe used to be okay with semis. Some of the mobile, the mobile companies and the infrastructure companies on the networking side used to be European, Siemens, NXP, et cetera. But most of these things have actually been consolidated, and there's not that much semiconductor capacity on the European side these days. What are the sectors that Europe can lead? What, what sectors is Europe leading right now in technology? So we, we would make the... Yeah, we would make the argument that it's not about any specific sector. It's kind of almost the European company and the American companies are kind of in the same same sectors. And it's once in a while the winner tends to be in Europe, and once in a while, most well, more than once in a while, a lot of times the winner tends to be in the U.S. So you know, there's nothing intrinsically great about music streaming so that made Spotify work. The one place where there's, there's a bit of an exception is uh, is is when it's regulatory. And so the European regulators, and in specific the UK regulators, have taken a really hospitable approach to, to fintech. And a third of the unicorns today in the UK, and the UK has the most unicorns out of all of Europe, now are all fintech companies. And that's largely because of what the Financial Conduct Authority, which is kind of our version of the Securities and Exchange Commission, mm -hmm. has done. They, they, they made a sandbox for younger companies. They made the capital requirements a lot lighter. You know, they took a very forward-thinking stance on, on fintech, and as a result, there's a ton of fintech innovation in the UK. And then the UK mm -hmm. government also legislated things like, you know, we have open banking accounts, which means that providers can actually look at your bank statements, and you can there's an API kind of feed that goes in, which allows you to kind of build layers of services on the financial services. So, you know, that, that market got deregulated in a way that was very good for consumers. Weirdly enough, they didn't do anything in the crypto side. So, you know, they did all this great stuff on fintech, but they didn't really do very much on the Web3 side. So, you know, they're a little bit on the back foot on, on, that, on that front. But other than fintech and, and maybe life sciences, which is different and are almost mm -hmm. orthogonal to, to tech investing, you know, I would say it's, it's almost the exception to the rule. There's nothing intrinsically great about cybersecurity in the UK. I mean, nothing, anything better that, that the best people in the US don't have, but the best company in the world in threat detection is Dark Trades. And that, you know, 
it, it's not that it, it was because it came from the UK. UK. It was just one of these things where the UK engineering team was world class, and then they were able to kind of figure out sales and marketing. So we keep a really broad view uh, of what we look for. We we've never specialized, and we think it's way too early still in in Europe's history to be able to do that. So, well, how do you do uh, due diligence on these uh, deep tech deals that you're doing? What's your approach on that and your negotiating approach? Uh, this is a question that Cyrus has in the, uh, the chat box here in the Q&A box. Uh, how, how do you approach this? Is it any yeah, different so, from so. what you would do in China or Silicon Valley? Or? I mean, I think venture is pretty similar in all of these places. And, you know, mm -hmm. we're... You know, I think a lot of our diligence is largely using our network to figure things out. So, you know, we did this protein engineering company. It's probably our best investment in our second fund right now or what looks like our most promising investment. You know, I'm not an expert on protein engineering. There, There is merit towards the UK, again, being in, in, in the protein engineering space because DeepMind actually sits inside of the UK. So that's, you know, Google's AI division and they're the guys that kind of came up with AlphaFold. But this company happens to be in Italy, not even in, in the UK. And, and the, you know, the, the, the lead scientist or the founder for this, you know, is doing something very different than what, what DeepMind is doing. You know, we were able to kind of call around folks, including people who are very early at DeepMind, to kind of get their take on, on what, what, what the product or service was, and we were able to get a lot of color. And then I was able to get someone who is very senior at Merck to take a look at the company, because this particular protein engineering is for the healthcare life sciences mm -hmm. industry. And, you know, out of courtesy to me, he organized a 30-minute call and kind of brought in one of his chief scientists, and that call ended up being 75 minutes. And even if you know nothing about protein engineering, if you know you've had to arm twist someone to do a meeting and they've like begrudgingly done a 30 minute meeting and the 30 minute meeting is not a 30 minute meeting, but like more than twice as long, there's probably something of merit at the heart of what it is that the person was listening to. Um, and we ended up co-investing into that company with Novartis uh, as opposed to Merck, but you know, and, and we were pretty convinced that we were onto something. And today we have six different drugs that are going through kind of the early stages of clinical trials that we, we have a software program that basically can, can, can do drug discovery. You know, I still don't understand the science. I have them explain to, explain to me in layman's terms, but yeah. I know that the team is really strong. And I know that, you know, these, these kind of reference checks that I kind of did made, made a, made a really big difference. And then, on negotiating, I'm a, I'm a bit of a softy, right? So as long as we have a decent amount of ownership and we're writing a decent check uh, and, and the terms are reasonably fair, you know, I'm not going to nickel and dime over the extra half a million or two million you know, valuation difference between one thing or the other because I'm taking a very long view sure. of, of how much value might be created. And I, I might have a tendency to overpay for things and that probably makes me a little bit more entrepreneur friendly and probably leaves a little bit of money on the table that you know, we tend to get into our companies at pretty good prices because people also really want to work with us. Yeah, and you have an entrepreneurial background too, so you kind of get it. Yeah, my first my first one is successful. The second and third one were pretty big duds, and the fourth one turned out to be a modest success. So I've learned a lot about what not to do, which which sometimes is more important than knowing what to do because you can prevent people from making the same dumb mistakes you did. So what was the biggest lesson? So the the biggest lesson on, on my side, I mean, it became pretty etched in. Is I think if you're building the third the third and fourth company, the third company was an enterprise software company, and I think if you're building an enterprise software company, we do a lot of enterprise software investing. You know, more so than the product is is being able to kind of go to market. And I think as an engineer and someone who kind of comes from a technical background, you tend to think the product's going to carry you all the way, and that does happen every once in a while. And there are product led growth companies. But largely, if you're going to become a really big company in enterprise software, you've got to get really good at being able to build a sales and marketing machine. And sales and marketing machine does not mean signing up customers because you can power your way towards doing that. It means really building a machine where you can build an army of people who can sign up. To, and and that, that is not easy to do. And that takes a lot of time and energy, particularly if you're technical in terms of learning that stuff. And, and it it's not particularly hard, but it feels counterintuitive because it kind of, in some ways, almost feels beneath you to do that. But you've got to make it a super repeatable, super easy to do kind of process that kind of anyone can kind of drop in. And then you've got to build a really good team around that. So you can't just take anybody uh, to then go kind of rinse and repeat. And it, it does become repetitive. And a lot of people think, you know, for these enterprise software companies, especially when they look at the big ones, you know, they, they're, they're platforms, right? So platforms are kind of product oriented and, and, and technology oriented. 
But I would say, you know, year one, year two is you've got to build your product. Years two to 10, you've got to build the world-class sales machine. And then in year 10, you end up, because you get so strong on the revenue side, you now yeah. have the ability to kind of go figure out the next product. And then you transition back into an engineering and kind of platform company from a leadership perspective. And so, you know. That's a lot to expect six, from one CEO. You cannot, you cannot do that. No one CEO can do all that. It's hard, but that's one of the reasons why you see a lot of the really interesting companies, Snowflake, Salesforce, et cetera, are run more by salespeople than they are by technologists. Like Mark Benioff is not, is not a technologist. He's a sales guy. You know, Frank, who, who started, who was the first CEO of, 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 sales, of, uh, of Snowflake, was, was a sales guy, not, not a technologist. So, you know, you, it, it's tough. I mean, but, but I, would, I would say you really have to appreciate building that go-to-market and sales and marketing machine. Yeah. So wh wh how is it different being a, a venture capitalist? Do you need sort of the same skills or wh what, what do you think are the main success ingredients for a VC? So one of, one of the biggest things that you learn when you're on the venture side is as an entrepreneur and as someone who's been on the operational side, you, you get very much in the trenches, right? And you, and you get really excited about the problems that you need to solve. I think as a venture person, the last thing you want as an entrepreneur is your venture person to get all in the details and to start almost kind of managing what you're doing. You know, even if they come from a base of experience, you didn't really take a check from someone so that they could kind of manage you. You know, what you really want is that person to be there. And so you have to switch from this very active mode to this very passive mode. You know, oh. I would say most of the time in these board meetings, you're not really saying or doing very much, but when the one or two times during the course of the year where you really have to say something, you're missing someone on your team, right? You really need to go build capacity in this thing. Then your voice carries a lot more weight. Whereas if you're if you're in every little detail with the company, you know, the big things and the little things all kind of blend into each other and your voice actually doesn't have that much weight. A lot of people I know who come out of operating backgrounds like as in they've been building companies before end up in venture and they don't like it because they're not in control of their own destiny. This very passive, weird way of working, um, yeah. you know, where, where you're kind of silent most of the time. And it's wow. slow motion. It feels very slow to, to, to do anything. Yeah. But you've got to run, kind of learn the right cadence for, for making, making sure your, your voice is as effective as possible when, when it really has to count. Okay. Have you ever had to change a CEO? Unfortunately, a couple of times. Yeah. Oh, really? And we've never, we've never really gotten it right. We have one, one case right now where we may have gotten it right, but I would say, you know, if, if you're an early stage investor, and we're an early stage investor, if the founder leaves, it's because something has gone horribly wrong. You know, they may not have been scaling, but most good executives don't want to go join a fragile company. If you're a world-class CEO, right, and there's no reason for you to join a company that's on its first million or two of revenue, because you don't get that much credit building it from one or two to 10. What you want to do is join a $50 million company and take it to 500, where a lot of that early risk is, is gone. So the people who actually want to be professional CEOs in these early stage companies, it's kind of, it, the, the, either they have to have a founder mentality, which means that they're founder, or, or something's really wrong. So if the founder leaves in those early days, you're kind of sort of, you know, you're, you're kind of up a creek in many ways. Like there's, there's not an easy way to fix it because there's not a big batch of people who are kind of lining up for that job. The good people don't want it. Um, and so, you know, those are hard, those are hard things to, 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 to do when you, when you end up, when you end up in that scenario. And fortunately for our companies is when they've become actually big and they've kind of crossed that chasm and they're getting to that 50, hundred million of revenue. The founders, it, it's usually been the founder who's been doing it. And so they kind of stay. There's not much of a reason for them to actually bring on someone. Where we spend a lot of our time is leaving the founder in, in, in the hot seat as a CEO and encouraging them and convincing them. And sometimes they don't always see it to build the bench around themselves because there is no way you can build a big company without a team around you. And there's no way you can actually grow the entire organization unless your leadership team around you is really good because otherwise you're going to be the bottleneck for every single company. So most of my conversation with companies is like, you are the bottleneck. Like if, if you're not there, nothing's going to get done. So like, you know, you're going to have to start building a, a team underneath you, which is empowered. And then they are responsible for doing the work and building out the teams, not you. And that gives you capacity to think like at the 50,000 foot level about where the company really has to go. And that, it's a hard transition for people because a lot of the founders are really good, 
are, are in the details. Like they want to build these companies, right? And they were there from the very beginning. They get it to the point because they were in everything, but they have to transition from doing that to kind of becoming coaches of people. And, and that's a bit of a transition. And oftentimes it requires a little bit of a poke from the venture person saying, hey, it's, it's time to remove yourself from the bottleneck, which means hire someone who's better than you at this and, and, and let them let them run with it, even if you may not always agree with everything that they do. Sure, sure. OK, well, there's a couple more questions here. Some of them are very detailed, like what sort of percentage shareholding do you look for in a seed round? So it depends on this. I would say the, art, the, the answer to this depends on the size of the fund. And what the calculation that most of us tend to run on the venture side is you want to have enough of a shareholding where if the company becomes a large company, and just for arbitrary sake, like take a billion as a number, there's, you, you get enough of a return to be able to return your fund, ideally more than once. So in other words, if you're a $25 million fund and you know you can own two and a half percent of a company, because if a company gets to a billion of, of, you know, of exit, you'll, you'll give all the $25 million back to your investors. Now, if you start at two and a half percent, that's not very good because you'll get dilution. And usually the rule of thumb for dilution between a seed investor to, to an exit, if it's a big company, is about a factor of three. So you probably need to start off at about seven and a half percent because the seven and a half percent will turn into two and a half percent by the time everything is done. And if you can be a 10 percent, that's even probably better because that will turn into three percent. So you'll be able to return the fund more, you know, more than just the one X. Now, that's kind of the rule of thumb. And then. You know, the top end of this is you probably don't want to take more than 30% of a business uh, because if you do, at some point the founder is going to wake up and the management team is going to wake up and they're going to realize they have too little skin in the game and you're going to have to correct that, which means they're going to take dilution at that point. So it doesn't kind of work. And that's kind of the natural rate, somewhere between 10 and 30. And I'd say most of us are these days and market correction notwithstanding because we're in a bit of a, you know, bit of a bit of a turbulent time in the stock market right now. But most of us have been kind of on the seed stage have been around the 10 to 20 percent and probably the 10 to 15 percent for the last couple of years because the market's been pretty hot. But the math is the bigger you are as a fund, the more ownership you need, because if you're a 500 million dollar fund, everything I just explained doesn't really work. Right. If you're a 500 million dollar fund, you make 25 million dollars on a company that goes that gets to a billion. You know, you've got 475 million to go before you give your investors any capital. So, you know, you, you need to own a lot more. The companies need to be that much bigger. I see. Good answer. All right. So um, a question about China to Europe and a VC money coming from China investing into Europe. How do you have any suggestion about deal sourcing for them? Yeah, so I, I would say you need to partner up with the local firms. And so, you know, what, what's ended up happening is some of the Middle East money has done this really well. So there's a big sovereign wealth fund in the United Arab Emirates called Mubadala. And what they did was they did about seven or eight LP investments into funds. And then they used those funds as their deal flow engines to figure out what's actually going on, where they could actually write the next check and actually put real checks to work. So their, their investments in the funds are probably like in the five to $15 million range. And their typical check size into a company is usually 25 million plus. So basically, they're buying deal flow for the first 10 million by by kind of investing in the funds. The the challenge that's specific to China is I think Chinese money is a little bit toxic right now just because of all the geopolitical stuff. And 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 in the U.S. there's actually some regulatory restrictions that these companies end up becoming U.S. Incorp U.S. Inc. Mm -hmm. You know the shareholder base actually does matter. And, you know, there are some folks where you, you can't, it's, it's not so easy to take money from them. Um, but the best way to do this, I think, is you build relationships, you make the seed fund your best, friend, your, your best friends, they have the nose for what's actually trending, even if it's not in their own portfolio, and they'll, they'll hand you over that deal flow, because it's in their own self interest to have someone else kind of mark it up. And that gets you kind of the, the, the slightly later stage, but probably not even very late stage kind of access to it. And, and the bottle has been doing this really well. Okay. Um, a question about the metaverse. Uh, we can't ignore the metaverse. So what is it a good space to invest in and what kind of returns could you see from the metaverse? I don't I don't really know. I mean, so I've been hearing about VR uh, and, and, and kind of the metaverse because you know, I'm, I'm a bit dated. You know, I was there during the dot com bubble when when VRML or Vermo was around. I remember when Second Life started. I remember when you had Have a Hotel and Club Penguin. Most people, you know, who are, who are kind of Gen Z don't even know what these companies are. And, and maybe this time around will be a little bit different. I worry that because there's a hardware requirement for the metaverses, in other words, you have to have like an Oculus, et cetera. Yeah, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I'm not so sure how much adoption, what adoption is really going to look like. But the counter to that is if you have companies like Facebook pushing this and, and 
kind of almost willing to subsidize it and, and kind of market it to consumers. You never know, and we could be in a situation where we're we're in the Ready Player One type of type of novels or, or or movies where you know the metaverse actually does come come true. What we've been investing is a little bit orthogonal to this. Is you know we have a couple of companies that are using augmented reality, and they're fusing what I would describe as the metaverse with the real world. So we have a construction company that's built a safety helmet. So it looks like a hard hat and it has a pair of visors, almost like Google glasses built into the, into the hard hat. And then if you put this helmet on and, and this is turned on, you see the three dimensional engineering plans in front of you, like, you know, in, in the right position, et cetera. So you know exactly where the beam that you're building is, is going to be, and it's down to millimeter level precision. Um, so, you know, you turn your head, the beam, the, the beam stays where it's supposed to be. It's, it's really quite, it's really quite, it's a, it's a cool sci-fi. Uh, so they're kind of taking this metaverse concept of the three-dimensional plans and layering them onto real life and then using this as a mechanism to error correct what the construction workers are doing because construction industry is full of error. And that company is doing incredibly well. They've signed a whole bunch of brand new kind of accounts, both on the on the construction side as well as like the big tech companies who are using them to build facilities and build data centers um, because you take all the error out. The only challenge for them is they charge $20,000 a month for each helmet per month with a 12 month minimum contract. And even then people are still paying for this because they can remove hundreds of thousands of dollars of error just with oh, the one helmet. It. What's so the name of it? Has, it has probably one of the worst names in our portfolio, XYZ. Uh, so it's either really easy or really, really difficult. Uh, it's not very creative, xyzreality.com. If you look at the URL, you'll see the videos of it. Okay, so that could come in handy with the Millennium Tower or Millennium Tower out here in San Francisco with all the problems it's having with uh, uh, tilting. It's thinking, yeah, thinking or tilting. <laughs> maybe, maybe they could uh, hire your company, um, hire your portfolio company. Anyhow, um, okay, so uh, look, let's get to our poll now. Uh, this is really a fun part of the program uh, where it's anonymous and we get some good questions coming in um, where you get to, uh, offer your view. Uh, so, okay, let's go. Let's uh, launch the poll, uh, launching the poll. Okay. The first, there's about eight questions and, uh, and um, uh, the saying I'm gonna read them out loud to you because I'm not sure you can see them, but the audience can see them and uh, they can answer right here, totally anonymous. Um, so the first question is real easy. Uh, what's your view of European tech innovation, positive, negative, neutral? Uh, pretty, think pretty positive. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, yeah. I wouldn't be here. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, can Europe create billion dollar tech companies? Uh, yes, no, or not sure. I hate to disappoint people, but it's already happening uh, and it's actually increasing in velocity every year. The question now is like, can it create like $50 billion, $100 billion companies? <laughs> okay. So what are, what are some of the European billion dollar tech companies then? I think you mentioned Klarna, is that one of them? Arna is one of them. Unity is another one. These are companies that went public. Elastic was another one that went public on the on the private side. I mean, the list is like there are like 130 of these. Revolut's probably the biggest fintech company, kind of outside of Stripe. It's about a 30 billion dollar company based in London. Um, trying to think of what's what's in what's in Germany or what's in France. There's so many of these now. Like a, a uni unicorns feel like almost a dime a dozen, but they're literally like I think 130, 150 of these in in, in Europe now. Didn't you say there were 49 of them in London now? Um, something like that, yeah. Lond Lond I, I think it's actually a little bit bigger than that. I think it's probably like 60, 70 in London. Really? Oh. Wow, what a change. Um, yeah, okay. it might be 60, 70 in the UK and probably 49 in London. That's probably the right number. Okay. Uh, and then, can Europe surpass China in DC tech fields? Um, so this may have already happened, but um, the same, what, what's your answer on this? <laughs> This, this happened in 2021, and I guess the question is, was it a fluke or was it like a one-off or is that something that's sustainable? You know, to be fair, I, I really do think the two biggest markets in tech are U.S. and China. Europe is third, but but the last year, Europe Europe became number two. Okay, amazing. Okay, is Silicon Dragon actually, it should have been Silicon Valley, still the global VC tech leader? Uh, that was a slip. I shouldn't have said Silicon Dragon. It should have said Silicon Valley. <laughs> But a lot of people said yes to Silicon Dragon. So <laughs> there you go. 
I, I, I think in, in, in general, Silicon Valley is still very much the nexus, even, even with all the remote working, even with people leaving the Bay Area, I still think it's the nexus of the industry. And I think there will be multiple nexuses of these industries, like of this industry in the future. But I think this one is super important. You kind of still need to know what's going on in the Bay Area if you really want to be a tech investor, no matter where you are in the world. Right. So how do you stay in touch with all that, given that you're in London? So in the old days, you used to fly back and forth. I was in the Bay Area probably every eight weeks. And, and these days, it's late nights and staying on Zoom, talking <laughs> talking to people like this. Oh, okay. All right. Well, that, that answers. What about the, where do you get your news? Or you don't really, you, you, it's mostly through your own sources or through no, news outlets or what's your primary source? What? Like a lot of people, I read Hacker News and I, and I read Tech Meme. I think Tech Meme does a really good job summarizing kind of all the tech news. And, and I think Hacker News has always had, always has interesting discussions and commentary in addition to the news. Okay. And then Which, Twitter. Oh, oh, Twitter too. Yeah, I know you're very active on Twitter. Everybody should follow uh, A. Kanji on Twitter. Uh, he's always um, has a view on something. Um, so yeah, there you go. Um, which European city leads tech VC, London, Frankfurt, or Paris? It's London and probably instead of Frankfurt, it probably should be Berlin. I think Berlin would really like to catch up and Paris has been doing an incredible job catching up. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, they made it, a, they made it almost like a national priority, but, but, but in terms of, in terms of which one's the biggest, I mean, it's London and, and London is by far the biggest. By far. Okay. Um, all right. Would you like to work in London? Most everybody. Uh, been been doing it for 15 years. Uh, I do miss America, uh, and I do miss New York, and I do miss the Bay Area. But, but you know, I do like working out, out here. And that one of the best parts about London is it's probably the most connected city in the world. So in yeah. a non-pandemic year, it's super easy to get around to pretty much everywhere you want to go, except yeah. for maybe Hawaii. Yeah, and the time zone is very good too. You're in the middle. Yep, exactly. I mean, the, the British had something right when they were when they were colonizing the world. <laughs> right. Um, which tech sector is most disruptive? Um, AI, 5G, mobility, robotics, space, cyber. I, I think in in general, the broadest of all of those categories is a, is AI, just because it touches on pretty much almost all of the other ones, ex except for maybe 5G. And so you know. I think the stuff that's happening in AI is still very early days in terms of what you can do with the, with this technology because it keeps changing. I told you our protein engineering one. I mean, the, the software is actually kind of designing the drug and I still think we're in the super early innings of this stuff because it, it grows exponentially in terms of capabilities. Okay, so 58% said AI. Uh, second was mobility, 17%. And uh, none on space. Space tech didn't uh, didn't register. <laughs> what is is, we're, we're seeing we're seeing quite a bit of activity now in space on both sides of the mm -hmm. pond. There there are people who are, who are running dedicated space funds, and there there are interesting companies. But it does feel futuristic if you actually don't know what's going on. I mean, yeah. you know, I think a lot of what SpaceX has actually been able to do in terms of building low cost satellites and low cost space programs. I, I think that's going to become a little bit more contemporary over the next 10 years, and there'll be a bunch of companies in that space. In, in, in that space. <laughs> okay. Um, what is the best stock exchange for globally oriented tech startups? Um, London Stock Exchange, NYSE, NASDAQ, Hong Kong Stock Exchange. I think it's a coin toss between the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ. Uh, they're almost interchanged. I mean, they're rivals, but you know, the, the New York Stock Exchange just caught up on the tech side. And, and NASDAQ historically has been the exchange of record. You know, I, I would love to see LSE kind of get its act together, but I, I just don't think you have the analyst coverage and, and, and the pool of capital on the LSE that you kind of need to, to, to be a global tech exchange. And then I think the Hong Kong exchange, especially what's happening with the geopolitics, that's mostly still a very Asian exchange. And then people are kind of wary. Even the Chinese companies end up going public on NASDAQ or New York Stock Exchange. Yeah, but some of them are delisting from New York and looking to list again. And Hong Kong. Yeah, and that's all part of those geopolitics. Yeah, definitely. So 17% uh, said London Stock Exchange. Uh, the favored one was NASDAQ, 67%. Uh, Hong Kong Stock Exchange came in at third uh, with 17%, and NYSE got zero. Uh, that's curious. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, 
Let's give you a few other answers. Can Europe surpass China in tech? Uh, and most people said no, that Europe cannot surpass China in tech VC. 67% said no. 8% uh, said yes. Uh, a quarter said maybe. Can Europe create billion dollar tech companies? Almost uh, three quarters said yes. Um, and 17% said not sure. Um, and the rest said no. Uh, and your view of positive, 50 of uh, uh, positive, uh, your view of European tech innovation, positive 54%, negative 8%, neutral 38%. So uh, those are kind of the results of our poll for today. Um, I'm gonna end the poll and thank you everyone for chiming in, we appreciate it. Um, I'll share the results as well with you uh, who are on the call with us. Um, so any other questions for, um, for Hussein here? And, uh, oh, you've got a really great comment here. Hussein is American, but he is the pride and joy of the United Kingdom. Okay, thank That's you so much. <laughs> uh, hello from Palo Alto. Hal Kelman says hello from Palo Alto. Um, let's see, any other questions? What, what did we miss on the poll, uh, Hussein? What, what question, what burning question did we miss? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. I mean, we always get these questions these days, especially with the stock market is what do you think the prediction is for 2022 and at oh. least this first quarter of 2022? And, you know, the honest answer is I don't know. I'm hoping that these, you know, the, the Fed rate increases a modest rate, you know, smaller modest rate increase and, you know, the markets maybe being a little bit too bearish in, in, the, in the short term and kind of things kind of come back to normal. But but the amount of money that's gone into tech in the last few years has been enormous. And, you know, it, yeah. would, it would be a shame to see that money kind of flow out. And my guess is a lot of that money, we're in a bit of a hiccup right now just because of the stock market. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's, it's probably gonna work itself out. It might just take like a quarter or so, but, but that's the one question that I've been getting asked this like kind of all week. And, and, and I genuinely don't know because it's really hard to be able to predict macroeconomics. Yeah, but what, what do you see any kind of reset happening with US-China tech? Uh, the relations, the business relations, the tech innovation, the decoupling, the cross-border deals. Uh, is there any reset happening that you can see? I don't know. I think, I think, I think, you know, the Biden administration could have taken a different tack, but I think it's kind of doubling down a lot of what the Trump administration mm -hmm. kind of was saying with, with respect to China. And, yeah. and I, I do think there's going to be an increasing like an increasing bit of a disconnect between those two geographies. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and to be fair, I think whatever happens at the US kind of Europe kind of follows suit. So I think mm -hmm. this geopolitical thing is, is is here for a little bit longer. I, yeah. I don't think that's gonna go away anytime soon. Yeah, okay. Uh, so Kevin is back with another question about the Hoxton Fund. How many seed investments do you do per year? We average these days about about eight eight seed investments, and we tend to do about three to four pre seed investments. That uh, mm -hmm. kind of a little bit more speculative for us. So, in a in a bad year, we're probably about four, and in a in a bullish year, in the last few years have been bullish, but it's kind of closer mm -hmm. to eight. Oh wow! Okay, that's a lot for a small team. Um, so, any so, comment on? Uh, yeah, were you going to say something? I was going to say that's the reason why I end up on so many boards. And so, you know, maybe we should be, you know, if, if there is a bit of a recession or a bit of a correction, maybe we'll slow down our pace a little bit and give myself okay. a little bit of breathing room with these companies. Or maybe hire some more people too. Yeah, we're, we're actually, we're actually hiring. So we're looking around. I mean, I think historically we were, we ourselves are a small business uh, because, you know, we started off as a small fund. We've gotten a little bit bigger over time. We've had good success. You know, we are short, like like a lot of small businesses, like a lot of the entrepreneurs that we say, you know, you need you need to not be the bottleneck. I, I know that I am the bottleneck in, in the business, and that part of it was that we just didn't have the capability of hiring up until up until this year or maybe last year. So we added one more partner last year. We'd love to hire another two partners this year. And so if there's anyone in the community who wants to do venture, that's been doing a little bit of angel investing, has an investment track record, is well connected in, in California and wants to come over to Europe. Like I'm all ears for, for having those conversations. Okay, you heard it here first, folks. Um, so what, now what's the size of your fund right now? Uh, we're a $200 million fund. Our last fund was 100 and the fund before that was 40. Okay, that's good progress. Uh, any comment on Ukraine? 
we have two companies in Ukraine. So it's a little, you know, so both of them have their engineering teams in Ukraine. Again, don't know what's happening with, with geopolitics. Um, you know, weirdly enough, when we talk to the, the, the company, the, the companies themselves, they we're more stressed out about the situation than, than they are. You know, they think they think no matter what happens, kind of life is kind of going to go to normal. And we had a company in Belarus as well, which, you know, a third of its staff had to kind of get evacuated out because Belarus had a, had a bit of an incident with Russia uh, in, in 2021. Uh, so, you know, these geopolitics kind of do affect us, you know, much more so than if you're in the Bay Area. But but again, all of those companies have, you know, they can move out, they can move out their staff if they actually have to. And, and they're much more global companies. So it's, it's not just Ukraine that they're worried about. It's, you know, they have, they have a bunch of operations uh, all over the world. But what happens is kind of anyone's guess over the next week or so. Uh, you know. well, you're watching it closely, though. Um, any comment on Hong Kong's status? So again, same thing. I think Hong Kong is eventually going to just become part of kind of mainland China. I mean, I think that's the way it, that's the way it's heading. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, you've been to Hong Kong. I know uh, I invited you to speak on a Hong Kong panel, and you uh, came over for that. And um, so, what was your impression of the Hong Kong startup scene? Any comment on that? The Hong Kong startup scene has, has been nascent. I mean, again, Hong Kong is a financial capital in many ways, but the community. There haven't been that many companies that have kind of come out of the Hong Kong, out of out of Hong Kong tech. Although, like in many other places, it, it's actually been on the rise. So, you know, the historical numbers are really low, but but there actually is a lot more activity, and there are a bunch of people kind of doing things. You know, and you know, my guess is my my guess is that we're going to see more, and we've already seen a few interesting companies out of Hong Kong kind of scale up uh, around the world. Clue could be a, a good example of one in the in the, in the travel space. Um, but uh, but it's been it's been slower to catch on. I think I think the challenge is when you have such strong financial cities, you have an intrinsic industry that people kind of gravitate towards. So the the best and brightest of the younger generation go into go into finance as opposed to go into building companies. Right, right. Okay. Um, well, good. We got a lot of great comments over here in the chat. Uh, everybody loved all your comments and uh, your insights. So that's great. Uh, so we're going to wrap things up now, and uh, thank you all for joining us again. I, we do appreciate it. And uh, let me just, um, we did the poll. I want to tell you about our upcoming shows as well. February 9th, we have a lady, Pocket Sun, from SoGal Ventures. It's her own firm that she founded with a partner a few years ago, and it's going strong. So they invest in diverse entrepreneurs. Uh, so she's going to be joining us from Singapore. And then next, uh, as I mentioned, it's a global show. We have someone um, coming from Sydney, uh, Nikki Skavak from Blackbird Ventures. Uh, he's got a unicorn company I know in his portfolio, which we'll get to hear about. Uh, so he's February 24th. And then after that, we have a, a panel on China-U.S. tech reset, uh, where we have uh, a number of venture capitalists, experts, uh, Salesforce executive, who are going to be talking about this idea of whether a China-U.S. tech reset, reset is in sight. That's March 2nd. Uh, so as you can see, we've got a lot of things lined up. Uh, we're going to be doing a program about Hong Kong's future uh, for startups uh, with Invest Hong Kong. That's April 26th. Uh, if you're in California, it's April 27th. If you're in Hong Kong, it's somewhere in the middle if you're in London. Uh, so uh, if you like this event, uh, then please join the Silicon Dragon Circle. I know a lot of you already have. If you join the circle, you get to go to all of our events for the full year and get to have some special invitations as well. So lastly, I'd really like to thank Hussein for joining us. Uh, thank you, Hussein, very much. Uh, thank you to Invest Hong Kong for your uh, support for this program. Thank you to all the participants. Uh, any last comments, Hussein? No, but thank you very much for, for having me, and thanks, everyone, for staying through to the hour and, and, and kind of engaging in, in, in the Q&A. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you again. I know you're a busy person. We really appreciate your time and your expertise. We'll see you next time. My pleasure. Sounds okay. Good. Thanks. All right. Goodbye. Bye.